Hello, hello, hello everybody and welcome once again to my regularly scheduled broadcast Kingdom Road with yours truly Sterling March where we discuss the correct interpretation of the Kingdom of God. Okay, uh, today's topic will be the difference between the church and religion. The difference between the church and and religion there is a difference there's a definite difference there's a huge difference and maybe uh, some of you don't realize that there is a difference but God never sent us a religion when he sent the word to us his, his son in the form of Jesus the Christ he never brought a religion he brought a government a government a kingdom government okay the Bible says in Isaiah 9 and 6, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders. He came to bring a government, a way of existence, okay, a system of governance for the earth through which we can achieve complete and ultimate success. And that's what, that's what it's all about. It's not about religion, okay. It's about a government, all right? Before we get started, of course, you know, we want to say our prayer. And I want to ask you now to get your pen and get your pad. Of course, that's not really uh, necessary if you have access to Facebook continually. You can always go back and watch my videos on my Facebook page. Make sure you, you put the spelling right. That's the spelling, that's the correct spelling of my name. Okay, it's, it's two eyes, no no E's. Okay, you go to my page, I have many videos there you can watch. By the way, this is my CD again. You may purchase it on Amazon, Apple Music, Spotify, uh, um, Amazon, on iTunes, on iTunes, okay? It's only about $10, and it has 13 great songs on it. You will love those songs. Okay? So, we're going to say our little prayer right now. By now, you should have your pen and pad. So, let's just bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Father God, for this opportunity again. Where we have a chance to differentiate between religion and your church. There's been a great misunderstanding there, Lord God, and we will set... We will try to set that record straight today. Help us, Father. Give us the skill and anointing needed, Lord, to bring this message through clearly. And Father, at the end of this, this session, may you get all the glory that is due to your wonderful and holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. The difference between the church and religion. Okay, let's get right into it. The church and religion have become, by modern definition and understanding, synonymous with each other. Considered now by most to be one and the same. Sadly, by those on the outside and on the inside, okay, it's not just, and this is a serious indictment, it's not just the people who are on the outside looking in, who really consider us to be nothing more than religious people. But even a lot of us who are in the church don't see ourselves as more than religious, okay? Because we don't really understand what the church is and what God created it for, what it means. Unfortunately, you know, and listen, I keep saying stuff like this, but I want you to understand I've, I've been through this. That's why I, I, could, I could say it. And I've been, in, I've been in several church organizations for more than 10 years, at least three church organizations, denominations for more, Christian denominations for more than 10 years, at least three. And, 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 and hardly any of them did I get the correct understanding of what the difference is between the church and religion. You know, only one I really got to understand what this kingdom thing is truly all about what God asked for, okay, what he gave, and what he sent his son to bring. It was a government, not a religion, okay? Religion, 
is Satan's greatest weapon. If he can get you to believe that by doing stuff uh, traditionally, monotonously, repetitively, over and over and over and over and over, every week, every Sunday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever, if he can keep you busy doing things that really have nothing to do with the kingdom, he got you. He got you. Don't let him get you like that, okay? Because religion does that. It has us doing things as a tradition rather than as a system of governance, okay? Or because of a system of governance, a lifestyle, okay? It's the same way you put so much importance on the government of your country. This is the same importance you're supposed to put on the government of heaven, the kingdom, okay? And you're supposed to put just as much effort into it just as much thought into it, just as much uh, research into it, to get as much understanding of it as you can. Okay, and that's the only way God says what? For lack of knowledge, my people are destroyed. Not sin. For lack of knowledge, there is a solution for sin. But you got to know it. Okay? The kingdom of God gives you that knowledge. The kingdom of heaven gives you that knowledge. Okay, and there's a difference, by the way, between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, which I will explain in a moment. Okay, but religion and, and, and the church, they are definitely not the same. Okay, according to Wikipedia, religion by definition is a particular system of belief in a God or gods and the activities that are connected with that system. Okay, let me read that again. Religion, by definition, is a particular system of belief in a god or gods and the activities that are connected with that system. You know, there are many activities that we do in the church, okay, that we think are essential to the worship of God, but they're really not. They're really not, okay? This is a spiritual walk. This has nothing to do with rituals. You see, you know what one of the main problems is? We get... Uh, caught up in the, the rituals that were done in the Old Testament. And that's why Jesus removed us from that. Okay? God initiated that for a reason. Okay? Back then he couldn't give salvation because salvation was could only come by one person and that was Jesus, who didn't come until the New Testament. But we read about all the rituals that the Israelites had to do and God commanded them to do. And we think, oh, okay, that's how we're supposed to be doing this thing. No, that's not how we're supposed to be conducting ourselves. That was a system under the law that God placed the Israelites under. That is not for the modern believer. Okay, unfortunately, the Israelite nation, known as the nation of Israel now, Israelis, they still predominantly still follow that system of religion by the law but what did god say behold old things have passed away now all things become new old things have passed away behold all things have become new you see that that's what he was referring to the Old and the New Testament. He's saying, forget the Old now. Well, not forget it, but I've given you something new that takes preeminence over the Old. Focus on the New now. I'm not saying to discard the Old. Remember Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law. He said, but, but you are no longer under the law. He said, the law still stands for those who have not received him. If you haven't received Jesus Christ as Lord, but yet you still feel you believe in God, then you, are, you, you place yourself under the law. But if you believe in Jesus, you are no longer under the law. He commanded that we are no longer under the law. Okay? So we got to make sure we have that understanding. We are not under that old system that was in the Old Testament. All things have become new. 
So please, the Old Testament has a lot of good history, a lot of good encouragement. You know, when you read about, listen, what is it? What what what? There are some people who have said certain things. I remember Bob Marley even said it. You know, if you don't know your history, then you don't know where you're coming from. You need to know where you're from. You need to know where you came from. And that's one of the reasons why it's good to know the Old Testament. To know where you came from. What was the origin of man? You know, all that stuff. You know, but the things that went on with the Israelites are not for you. They're not for you. Jesus gave you a new, better way. A more excellent way with him. And he says, I have removed you from under that law. You are no longer under that law. Everything that was done with the Israelites was under law. You, the modern believer, the New Testament believer, are no longer under that law. Okay? So, as I could just continue with what I was saying about the Wikipedia definition, many religious systems are formally organized with constitutions and bylaws, maintain offices, are served by clergy or lay leaders, and the nations where permissible often seek non-profit corporate status or status, okay? Usually part of denominations which are often called churches in many traditions, and they usually meet in a particular location, okay? This is not God's definition of his church, okay? God didn't tell you to stay in no particular location for one thing okay he tell you to go he didn't say stay he said go okay by definition the word church is translated from the Greek word ecclesia meaning assembly of people now let me just say something about my, what I just said just now about going okay I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with you meeting in a building okay but your focus must not be the building okay your focus must not be the building because he didn't say that you must just meet in the building. He said go. So if his command to you is to go, then you cannot just go, just meet in the building every week. You must go. Okay? He said go. He didn't say stay and meet. He said go. So you can meet to make your plans to go. That's what you stay and that's what you meet in the building for, just to organize yourself to go and do missions to do ministry, to evangelize. That's what you meet in the building for. You don't have the building as your your place of, 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 of worship. Okay? Worship is, you are God's temple. You worship God anywhere you are. Anywhere. Even corporately, you could, you could, you could meet in the park in a different neighborhood every week and have a service there. Think about how effective you would be if you did that, just go into a different area, different subdivision, a different city, different community, and just meet there on the park and watch how many people will be attracted to you. And you can get the message to these people. A lot of people won't even step foot inside a church. But if, they, if you come to them, they will, they will listen. Okay, just to hear what you have to say, they, just out of curiosity, they will listen. But hey, you got them to listen. This is your opportunity to give them the truth, if you have it. Okay, and by the way, when you go, carry something with you, please. Bless the people. Okay? By definition, the word church is translated from the Greek word ekklesia, meaning assembly of people. This is God's definition now. Ekklesia, meaning assembly of people. These people are in every denomination, okay? I'm not saying that no denomination is, denomination is necessarily right or any is necessarily wrong. I'm saying the true people of God are in every denomination. We just find ourselves in different denominations sometimes because of following maybe family members or friends or whatever reason, but in our hearts, a lot of us really do believe in God and really are serious about God. You know, we are the church. But we just found ourselves in different denominations. But you got to check the origin of those denominations. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Okay? These people are in every denomination. They are not only found in the building, but also outside. Meaning, 
one does not have to attend services like clockwork to be God's church. Okay? You don't have to go to church every week, three times a week, twice a week to be God's church. Okay? You don't have to be going to church regularly at all to be God's church. Hey, I haven't attended church now for since uh, COVID. I haven't attended church since COVID. That's almost about a year and a half now. But I am the church. Okay, because I obey God and I take his message to the world. Which is what I'm doing right now. It has nothing to do with you meeting in a building. As a matter of fact, if the building was so important, we'd be in trouble. Because with COVID, nobody was able to go in those buildings. We couldn't even meet. And I think God allowed that to happen just to show us, look, stop putting so much emphasis on the building. It's not about the building. You see, now you can't even meet in your precious built building. I want you out of it. And, and, and I want you to demonstrate to me now that you can't even go inside of it if you really mean, if you're really serious about me. We couldn't even go in our churches. Can you imagine? You know, if, 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 the, if the building was, was, what it was what it was about, wouldn't the church have dissolved? Is, doesn't the church still exist? When we found ourselves having to go online and have church online, we thrived. We kept it together. And guess what? More people get to watch us then because now, especially on Facebook, we keep promoting our church, we keep promoting our services online, and people see it, and now, and let me tell you something, that COVID forced, forced a lot of church organizations to go online, who would not have gone, on, gone online at that time. Okay, it forced a lot of organizations to go online. And now are maybe getting more uh, people's attention, having a larger audience, and getting through to more people because they were forced to go online. They had to get themselves together. Get out. Jesus was saying, look, I tell you to go. And look, like if I, if I don't get you at them church, you ain't going to go. Well, by going online, you went. Exactly as I am doing right now. So you don't have to meet in the church to be the church. Okay? He did ask us to meet, to fellowship together, you know, but it doesn't have to be in a church building. I, no, I shouldn't say the church. Let me keep saying the church building is a difference, okay? Church building and the church are two different things, okay? These are those, to be, they, are only, they are not only found in the church, in the building, but also outside, meaning one does, one does not have the ten services like clockwork to be God's church. These are those who have been called out by God. God's called out once. His family. Okay? He loves his family and they love him. Okay? Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's just a word of reminder. Remindance. You cannot be God's church if you don't obey. Okay? You have to obey. Okay, if you want to develop a habit, develop that habit. The habit of obedience to God. Okay? Now, concerning church. Jesus spoke only on two occasions using the word church. Only on two occasions. Okay? Matthew 16 and 18, he said, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Matthew 16 and 18. You are Peter, and on this rock... I will build my church. Now, contrary to popular belief, he was not referring to Peter as that rock. A lot of people believe that, you know, I've heard people say things like, Peter was the first bishop, you know, all kind of stuff. Listen, Jesus was not saying Peter was the rock. Okay, how Peter could be the rock that the church was built on? Peter had all kind of issues. Okay. Peter could not be the rock that the church was built on. Okay, and let me explain that to you. Jesus was using a simple play on the Greek words Petros and Petra. Okay, they both mean rock, but one means, 
spectrum means the foundation and chief cornerstone of the church, which is him. Okay, when he said upon that rock, upon this rock, he was referring to himself, meaning the foundation and the chief cornerstone of the church. Okay, and Petros, okay, referring to Peter, indicating the role of believers as the living stones which are built on Christ as the foundation and cornerstone, as explained in 1 Peter 2, 5, and 6. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. The Petra. The rock Jesus was referring to was the statement made by Peter in Matthew verse 16 and 16. Jesus had asked a question of his disciples. Matthew 16 and verse 13, he asked, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? Simon Peter replied in verse 16, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied in verse 18, On this rock, meaning the reference of him in the statement, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, he was saying, on that statement, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. On that statement, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's the only rock that the church could have been built on. Him, he, that's why he was referred to as the chief cornerstone. He was the big rock. The big stone that the church was founded, founded on. Him. Okay? In another statement, Jesus refers to the church as separate and apart from the outside world in our dealings with each other. Okay? He was giving us a little idea of how the church is supposed to be towards each other. In Matthew 18, 15 to 17, he, he highlights this relationship. In verse 15, he says, If your brother sins... Go and show him his fault in private. If he listens and pays attention to you, you have won back your brother. In verse 16 he said, But if he does not listen, take along with you one or two others, so that every word may be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Verse 17, If he refuses to tell it to the church, if he refuses, tell it to the church. And if, he free, if, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be as a Gentile, an unbeliever. Remember, at the time that Jesus made the statement, nobody had gone to the Gentiles yet. So the Gentiles were still unbelievers. That's why Jesus was saying, let him be as a Gentile, meaning as an unbeliever, and a tax collector. In this way, Jesus was intimating that the church was a family that conducted affairs with each other, differently from the world. Nowadays, we see quite differently within the church with matters being settled in courts. Now, that's a shame. Okay, because that's that is not the family way. It is not that's not the church. I mean all these situations we see nowadays where the church taking each other to court. You trying to tell me now you are a, a, a community of believers. But you will go to the unbelievers to settle your differences? What's that? How are you going to take your matter that involving God to someone who you don't even know if they even believe in God or know Him at all? You're going to let Him? You know, but you know why you're doing that? Because you're just like them. You're no different from them. You do that because you believe more in the system of the unbelievers than the believers. Jesus said it. He told us how to do it. He said, take your matter to the church. Okay? Take it to the church. Now, either you don't believe in the church or you don't believe in your church. But the thing about it is, you trust Jesus' word. And if you are in a church that you don't believe in, then you should not be there. Okay? You need to leave that church. 
Because if you got to go to court to solve any difference between you and any brother in that church or sister, if you got to go to court to deal with that, to a judge that you don't even know if they know God, then you really ain't, you ain't, you ain't for God. I'm sorry, but you're not for God. Okay. And the thing about it is, which you're, you're fighting over things that belong to God. <laughs> That's the crazy thing about it. Everything in the church, ain't nothing in the church was paid for by the pastor. Okay? Everything that was paid for in the church is paid for by the donations of the church itself, the believers. Everything. Now, he may put it in his name, but it don't belong to him, and he shouldn't do that. It belongs to the community. Okay? He could be the overseer. But he can be the owner. It belongs to God. Because his people gave the money for it. Okay? So you shouldn't be fighting over it because it don't belong to you. And if, 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 if God has something for you, you, can, you ain't nobody can be able to take that from you. Okay? God will settle that for you. Okay? The modern church has placed more emphasis on organizational structure than its love for God and each other and obedience to his word. Okay? That's all we that's all that's that's what it's all about these days. You know, who's the bishop? Who's the archbishop? Who's the pope? Everybody wanna be in charge. And everybody wanna have this say, the strongest say, you know. Why not just sit back and say, Okay, y'all 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 fight it over. I ain't gonna let God handle this for me. And I guarantee you, you'll be shocked to see how you will come out on top in that situation without even fighting. Remember now, the battle ain't yours. No how. Why are you fighting if the battle ain't yours? You see, all this is evidence that shows that you are not the church. You're not. Because the church don't fight with each other. Okay? I believe Jesus' desire was that we, cre that we not create physical structures to hang out in. But commune as families, create communities who subscribe to his message which left with less emphasis on formal organization. I mean, we got these big, big, big old buildings with these people who, who want to control everything that goes on inside it like it's their building and their money would build the building. Okay. Creating all kind of strife in the church because of this, their strong-handedness, not allowing anybody else to have any any decision-making ability in that organization but them. They decide everything. One man, and then when push comes to shove, he got to carry somebody to court to settle an issue. Oh boy. Okay, boy, I tell you, Jesus said in John seventeen twenty to twenty-three. He said, his desire is that we, be, he said that his desire is that we all be as one like he and the Father. That's what he wanted to y'all unite, man. The church is more separated today than ever. Separated into many, many groups, denominations with their own agendas. When our oneness, our oneness would have displayed to the world our unity in Jesus and why they should follow him. See, that's the problem. There is nothing worse than a infighting in a church. The, that church loses its credibility to many people. And the bigger the church that church is, the more people they lose. Who wants to be a part of a church where there's no unity? If there's one thing that Jesus asks us to be is unified. So that when we go to the world to take this message, they see us coming as one. They say, okay, this is something I could be a part of. This is something I could believe in. But if they see you coming, they go and they look, they go online and look at your history and you just last year you was fighting over the church building, over the property, over some assets the church have. Who wants to be a part of that? Okay? Or, or, or who should run the church? Come on, man. 
Listen to me. If it was me, and this is me, when it comes to a situation like that, whether who should run the church, if it, if it comes to that, I would say, but I say, Lord, if you chose me, then you will put me where I belong as the leader of this church. If you don't want me to be the leader of this church, then let me go on my merry way and let me and, and you start a new church, Ruby. You start a new community with me. A community that will be built on you and your truth, not on some ideas of some individual or desires of some individual. Let them have that. Why should I fight over that? What? What is it? What are I fighting over? Money? My God already told me he can take care of me if I seek him first. And if he wants me to be the overseer of any church community, then he would put me there. And nobody would be able to remove me. See what you see? Remember Moses? When they murmured about Moses, God gave them leprosy. Remember Miriam? His own sister. Okay? The next time they did it, God killed thousands of them. Listen, you don't need to fight over a church. Okay? All that money that, that was given to build that church and to put everything inside that church came from the generosity of the people of God. Okay? It don't belong to you. It belongs to God. And God will let God decide who should lead. Okay? Okay, that's all. And, it will, and trust me that you will, that church will be, you will be blessed. You'll be surprised at how fast, how quickly God will reestablish you. I'm telling you, man, you don't need to fight, man. God, people don't need to be fighting. Okay? Jesus never gave instructions on the methodology for forming the church organizations we see today. This is all man's doing. Religion at its best. Jesus never told us to have no bunch of denominations, have no bunch of different style of this, style of that, and we got our own system of beliefs in this church. We don't believe in eating certain things. And in this next church, we... We bow in the statues, and in this next church, we 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 don't believe in marriages, all, all kind of stuff, weddings, and we don't believe in, in in independence and all kind of. Listen, man. You see, it was never about those things anyway. Those things are just byproducts of the church. Okay, the main message of the church is the kingdom of. God. That's the main message. Okay? What did Jesus say? You shouldn't even get married if you're not equally yoked. Anyhow, concerning marriage. What did he say was concerning food? All things are permissible to you. Just give thanksgiving for it. You need more than that, but you still push in only eating certain foods. Okay, come on, man. Let's 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 stop this, man. Let's stop this. We are supposed to be as one. He said, one church. Okay, Ephesians four four to six said, there is one body and one spirit. Even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all who is above all, and through all, and in all. My question, my question is then, me, my question is then, what was the true motivation for so many different denominations? It cannot be to foster unity of the church. Would we, if we was fostering unity of the church, then what would we have in all these different denominations for? How can they all be Christian? Anyhow, that word is another, that, that word creates another issue, Okay. Listen, this is what I want you all to do. Because plenty of you all are in, in organizations that you don't know the origin of. Study the origin of the organization you belong to. The religious organization you belong to. How it came to be. Okay? To find out how it started. Because you may find you may not want to be a part of that organization anymore. You see, you cannot be a part of something and not even know its history. 
That's why I said the Old Testament is good so you could know where you came from. Okay, that's what it's good for. You better study your church history and find out how that church came to be. Who it was who founded that church. What his motivation was. Okay. Because Jesus wasn't the, the originator of these denominations. Jesus wasn't even the originator of the word Christianity. That was not Jesus. Jesus didn't make, didn't start that word. That word was started by some folk at Antioch when Paul went there to teach to start a church there. They start, first started calling people Christians in Antioch. That had not, Jesus didn't do that. That had nothing to do with Jesus. Jesus never told nobody to call his people Christians. Okay, and that word carries a lot of connotations. And to be honest, I don't consider myself to be a Christian. I don't call myself a Christian. I'm a believer. You don't notice you keep, me, keep hearing me saying believer. I am a believer. I'm not a Christian. I don't like that word. That word puts you in a certain box. And there have been many atrocities committed by so-called Christians over millennia. Study that word. Study that history, the history of that word Christian. And you'll be shocked about the millions of people that were killed by Christians. People calling themselves Christians. Okay? Jesus never told us to call ourselves Christians. As a matter of fact, the people at Antioch who started calling, who were calling, who started calling the followers of Christ Christians, they weren't even saved. They weren't Christians, followers of Christ. They saw the people following Christ. They started calling them Christians. They weren't followers. Okay? Tell you all, you better do your research. You better do your research. It takes study. I like to study. I like to know what it is I'm a part of. I like to know what it is I'm researching. I like to know what is the origin of what I'm a part of. Okay? The original church. Let me tell you a little bit about that. Okay? The first church began in Jerusalem at Pentecost with 120 believers in an upper room where the apostles received the Holy Spirit after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Okay, the first church began at Pentecost with 120 people. Okay, it began as a Judaic community, but eventually split into a Christian and Judaic movement with the inclusion of the Gentiles through mainly Paul's ministry, where the name Christian was first given to followers at Antioch. See, that's how the name Christian came about. When Paul was preaching and, and, and the people around saw people going to Paul, they said, oh, see, they, they followers of Christ. They're Christians. You see? So that word carries no divine meaning. Okay? That's just a, a word that people, uh, I guess you could say, conjugated into another word. They, 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 they conjugated the word Christ into Christian because just to say, well, those are people who follow Christ. That's all that that's that's all that word means. There's nothing divine about the word Christian. It's just a word given to people who were following Christ. Okay? You could have called them believers. You could have called them the saved, the followers of the way. Which is what Jesus called it, the way. Okay? There were certain fundamental drastic differences between the Judaic and Christian church, okay? The Judaic church did and still does not subscribe to the message of the kingdom of heaven as taught by Jesus the Christ. They still don't believe in it. The Judaic community still exists now, okay? The Judaic community still exists in Israel today. They still do not ascribe to the kingdom message. As a matter of fact, they do not subscribe to Jesus at all. Okay? They don't believe in Jesus. The New Testament is not even read in their community, with only Old Testament laws and promises being the guidelines for worship of God without Jesus. And that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a deadly, deadly, detrimental thing. Okay? This is to the detriment of the Judaic faith. As God's new thing, Jesus was God's new thing, 
and we say all things about all things have passed away behold all things become new this was the new thing jesus in the new testament being the only entrance to his kingdom through his sacrifice on the cross new testament scriptures clearly outline this historical fact okay and second corinthians 5 and 17 it says therefore if anyone is in christ he is a new creature the old things listen now the old things have passed away this is the old testament it's talking about behold new things have come see i i, I keep saying it i know some of you have probably called me a heretic when you've heard me say it do not put so much emphasis focus on the old testament just read it for the historical content okay all things have passed away he said behold i'm doing a new thing okay and then and, and john 10 and 9 this is what jesus said i am the door anyone who enters through me will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture okay i am the door so anybody who disregards the new testament disregards jesus anybody who disregards jesus disregards the kingdom message anybody who disregards the kingdom message cannot receive salvation it's as simple as that that's how important it is that's how important the new testament is okay as a matter of fact and i'm going to make a very bold statement right here you can be saved if you only ascribe to the new testament mm -hmm. you don't have to even read the old testament to be saved everything about being saved is in the new testament all of it as long as you believe in and receive what the new testament says you can be saved that's where jesus is that's where the savior is what did god say no man cometh to the father but by me this is what jesus said he said i am the door anyone who enters through me will be saved if you don't come through me you can't be saved so there were people in the old testament who did get salvation but guess how they got it through jesus even though he came hundreds and hundreds of years after they died and was buried they still got salvation through him because as long as they died in God, believing in God, like Moses, like Joshua, like Samuel, like David, Solomon, and all the rest, as long as they died believing in God, they slept until, well, they're still sleeping. But on that day, when Jesus comes back, they will receive their salvation because they died believing in God okay because he's the only way and he he his salvation goes beyond the grave okay or beyond the side into the grave what did he do he remembered the Bible says he went into hell and he took the keys to hell death and the grave so even those who died before him are privy to his salvation okay can also receive his salvation that's how powerful Jesus was or is I should say because his blood is still in power today still saving lives still healing still delivering still doing it God the Father put all power into his hand the Bible says he was the first of all creation and he created all things all things were created by him and by him nothing was made that was made all things were made by jesus as the word and when he came to earth he was jesus but he was the word then this being 
is so powerful that even after his death and resurrection, he is still healing, saving, delivering right now. And he's saving those who have died thousands of years before him, those who are alive today, and those who will receive him in the future. He's already saved them. He knows who it is. The Bible says he knows his sheep and his sheep know him. Hmm? He's just giving us a chance to live that life out, you know, to, to, to give ourselves to him. He knows who are his. Okay? The Bible says we were in God even before the world was formed. Before God created the earth, God knew us by name. Okay? He already knew who were his. Okay? The Israelites as a nation, predominantly Judaic, Okay, right now Israel is 82% Judaic, don't believe in Jesus. By their own volition have removed themselves from the mercy of God's plan to be saved and have instead chosen to remain under the works of the law by which no man can be saved. They remain in that state even until today. Listen, even though the Old Testament makes reference to Jesus coming many times, they have not received it. Okay, that's the strange thing that I don't understand about the the Judaic people, the Judaic religion, Judaism. They say they only subscribe to the Old Testament, but the Old Testament prophesied about Jesus over and over and over and how he would come, what he would be like, what he was bringing. It told it, it prophesied all of that. So why when he came? They didn't believe it was him. I, I don't understand that. What, 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 you, what you looking for? What, why, why, after he did all these things in your, free, in your face, that's why Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, you know. Because these people saw him do all these miracles, and what they say? You ain't, you doing that by Satan. Oh my God, didn't the, your book that you ascribed to, the Old Testament, tell you that he was coming? And he was going to be doing these things? So why you didn't believe it when it happened? And why still today have you still not received them even though it tells you only by him can you be saved? But I, 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 don't, I don't understand that. But that, that's, that's, that's the choice they made, okay? But God says, and God says since then, since they did that, he said, okay. He said, I'll, I'll break them out of my natural olive tree. I've broken them out and I've grafted in my Gentiles. He said, and I put a spirit of stupor on the Israelites. And they will they have remained in that state even to this day. They are still in a state of stupor. Okay, that's where we get the word stupid from. Okay. He said, and I will not look to them again until I have gotten all my Gentiles. He said. Now you see that? He came into his own, the Bible says, and his own received him not. But he gave himself to the Gentiles. And guess who taken the message of the kingdom to the world? The Gentiles. The very ones who didn't know him, had no idea about him, they wasn't looking for him. We are the ones who are taking this message to the world. Okay, his own didn't even, don't even receive and they don't care to take it. So what do you do? He said, I can make them confused. I can confuse them so they will never be able to find me no more. Until I am ready to give myself back to them. He said, and then, he said, and only then, if they change their unbelief and repent, will they be saved. Well, the chances are they still ain't going to repent because, well, I can't say that. Okay, I can't say that. I hope that they do. I pray that they do. You know, they gave us Jesus. I pray that they, well, they gave us the physical form of Jesus. But I pray that they do. I don't know how that's going to happen, though. That's that's because if, if you don't read the old, if you refuse to read the New Testament, I don't know how you're going to even learn about Jesus. I, I don't understand that. Okay. Uh, even okay. Even though the Old Testament makes reference to Jesus coming many times, religious folk do the same with the New Testament. That's right. Okay. The same thing that the Israelites did 
and are doing today in serious denial about what the book said and refuse to believe Jesus Christ. New Testament believers are doing the same thing to the New Testament today. The things that are stated in the New Testament, they are in denial of it. And they refuse to receive it. Same thing. I tell you, religion is a powerful tool of Satan. I'm telling you, don't listen. You see all this, this, this emphasis on my face? It is a scary thing. Okay? People are being held in bondage today, not because they don't have the truth. Remember God used to say, God said once, for lack of, not once, several times, for lack of knowledge, my people are destroyed. Well, today, people have the knowledge, but are still denying it. God said they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Okay, they receive something, but they don't truly get it. And you can't have a form. You gotta have the real deal, baby. You can't deny the power thereof. You gotta receive it in its entirety, okay? They still won't obey God. They still say, no, God ain't mean that. That ain't what God meant. God says certain things in the New Testament that he says we're not supposed to be doing in this church. But we're still doing it. Most churches, 99% of the church is still doing it. And he said, don't do it. You know what it is concerning women. He said, Paul said, that this is a commandment of God. Listen, for that one breach of God's commandment, you could go to hell. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay? All right. Cherry picking what they like. That's what they do. People cherry pick nowadays. There is a misunderstanding. See, they believe most of what Paul say, but some of what Paul say they don't. They, they, they take out. Now, you see, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't cherry pick your word like that. If Paul says that you can't do something, you cannot do it. You shouldn't do it. If Paul says, if, if it's Paul that you are learning about God from, and learning how a New Testament believer is supposed to act, and you can't take some of what Paul says and discard the rest. you got to take all or nothing. And if you're taking nothing, then you lost. Okay? Because Paul had a, 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 an encounter with Jesus himself. Paul was handpicked by Jesus to be the first to take the message of the kingdom to the Gentiles. Okay? All right. Well, Paul along with Peter, you know. So, there is a misunderstanding about which testament is God's priority, you see. Without Jesus, no man can be saved. Receiving the knowledge of the New Testament alone makes you saved. Okay, I just said that a little while ago. Uh, we have a confusion about which testament is God's priority. Well, the, the New Testament... Even if, it ain't, even if it isn't God's priority, it should be yours. Because only in the New Testament do you get the knowledge of how to be saved. But well, isn't that what it, what, what, what it comes down to? I might tell you all, this life we have on earth is only a blur. It's a flash. That's all it is. This 70 plus years ain't nothing compared to eternity. It's only a blur. A blur. You know the blur is? B-L-U-R, blur. Like gone, like it, whoosh, just go like that. That's all this is. Here today, gone tomorrow. But you ain't gonna ever die. You're a spirit. Spirits don't die. You'll either be weeping and gnashing of teeth, or you will be with no tears, no sadness, no sorrow forevermore. Okay, blessed to the nine. The church is neither Jew nor Gentile. Okay, let's just make that clear. Okay? Only by way of the grace of God, through Jesus, is salvation possible. Any and every person can qualify. Now, let's talk about the modern church. Okay? Though Jesus regularly attended meetings of the church, his message is primarily not that we go to church, but that we be the church. Okay? 
However, by his example, we are commanded to meet and fellowship together, as was his custom in the early church. Okay, he said, yeah, you meet together. I have a place you can meet together. It don't have to be the same place, though. But just make sure that you meet and fellowship together. Share your victories and, and, and testimonies and, and, and encourage one another. Nowadays, most people ascribe the name church to the building, organization with emphasis on the physical edifice of the leaders or board as the church. Okay? We see the leaders in the church as the church. We don't, we, we say we go into church. What do you mean you go into church? You are the church. Okay? You going to meet with the rest of the church. You ain't going to church. You are the church going to meet with the other member, with the other church, um, um, other members of the church. Okay? You are the church. You're not going to church, okay? Churches are now viewed basically as a business, which is a shame to the kingdom plan of God because it categorizes the church as a legal and financial entity, which is not nearly its primary reason for existence, even though the ideology of the kingdom of God is a legalistic one. What does that mean? Like I tell you, the kingdom of heaven on earth, which is the kingdom of God, is a government. It is a legal government. Okay, in every way, it's just like the government of countries of the earth. In many ways, except for its ideology. Okay? It has many of the attributes of nations of the earth. Okay, it has an army, the angels. It has money, Okay, currency, tithing and offering, it has laws, it has a constitution, the Bible, it has ambassadors, which is you, okay, these are all legal uh, terms in a nation, so it is a legal entity, the king is a legal entity. Like my pastor used to say, it's a political position. Okay. Jesus wants to want us to know that he is, just like how we have kings on the earth, but the kings that used to exist, he is that kind of king. Only thing different is that he is a benevolent king. They were not benevolent king, all of them. Okay. Some of them were terrible tyrants. He, he, they, there was none like him. And there was never a kingdom like this. Okay. But in that way, it's a legalistic organization. The church is meant to be an arm of a system of government like no other that ever existed. The church is the embodiment and ambassador of God's heavenly government, the kingdom of heaven, on earth known as the kingdom of God. See, in, the, in, in, in heaven it's the kingdom of heaven. Okay? It comes and it lives in the people on earth who receive it. We are the kingdom of God. It's called the kingdom of God on earth. Okay? In heaven, it's the kingdom of heaven. Okay? On earth, it's the kingdom of God. Because it's in us, the people. Okay? It can't be the kingdom of heaven on earth because heaven is not on earth. Okay? Heaven is in heaven. Heaven is not on earth. Okay? It's the kingdom of God on earth. Its purpose is to replicate heaven's ideology of existence through the rulership of God, which is mankind's only way to complete and successful existence. Its reasonable service is that it teaches the world what it means, how to acquire, and the responsibility required to be in the kingdom of God. These are all taught by God himself through his Holy Spirit, not man. Man is just a vessel. This is vitally important because every human being expresses his or her idea of what a thing is based upon their experiences, which can cause a misunderstanding of the true nature of God. Okay, God doesn't want us to teach this word of ourselves. He doesn't want us to carry this message of ourselves. Remember I told you in my last broadcast, what did he tell his disciples? He said, wait until the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Wait said and then he said take my message to the world wait for the teacher wait for the guy wait for the one who will teach you 
and, and give you the truth of this message. Don't carry this without him, because you're going to mess it up, okay? So God doesn't want us to teach it of ourselves. He says he wants his people to teach it who are, who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Okay, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you have no business teaching this message. Because you, don't, you won't understand it, and you're going to mess it up, okay? So just wait until you know for sure that you have God on the inside of you before you start teaching this message, okay? Only through relationship with Him can one get the true meaning of His kingdom. We can be given examples based upon someone's life, but because men are flawed by sin, God gives His Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. Okay? You remember that, that experiment we used to conduct as children, the, the message passing experiment, where you tell someone something, and then you let the message pass from person to person down to about 10 people. You notice when, by the time I reach that 10th person, the message is different. It's completely different. That is the problem. Okay? That's why God doesn't want us without the Holy Spirit to teach this message. Because by the time it gets around the world, from us teaching it of ourselves, it will not be the message that he gave. He said, let the Holy Spirit be in you, the believer, and you, the receiver. That way, it will be passed on from person to person correctly. It, will, it won't change. The reason why you hear it being spoken about differently in these different denominations is because the people who are teaching it do not know God. They don't have the Holy Spirit. I mean, that, that's, that sounds harsh, right? But this is the truth. It's truth. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and 14, Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life. He said. Remember he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, and few there be that find it. So don't get upset with me because I keep saying that these people don't know it or don't know him. Jesus himself said, only few know me. Only a few. That sounds rough, eh? Because there are uh, Christians, there are over 2.4 billion Christians, so-called Christians in the world. Now you know, ain't no way you got 2.4 billion believers on this eh? No way. If that was the case, this whole world would, would, would know Jesus by now. Instead of the messed up way it is right now. Everybody calling themselves a Christian now. I've heard people who discuss and carry on but publicly say they are Christians. Okay? Hey, listen. I'm not saying you're not going to make a mistake or sin, you know. What I'm saying is you're not going to intentionally do things. If you are led by the Holy Spirit, you may do it on you're going to do it unintentionally. But you're not going to intentionally just blurt out things and say things if you're led by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Being the church is not merely believing what the Bible declares that happened to a man named Jesus. It actually happened historically. Okay? Let me read that again. Being the church is not merely believing that what the Bible declares that happened to a man named Jesus actually happened historically. In other words, many believe that what the Bible says happened, happened. But that's not being the church because you believe it happened. Just because you may believe that there was a man named Jesus who went to the cross, but you may not actually believe in what he did and what he said and in him. You may only believe that it happened, the history of it. But being the church means that you believe that in it, that you receive it, that you receive what he says. And so because you believe in what he says, something changes in you. Okay? Even religions outside of Christianity believe that Jesus happened, though they do not believe he is the Messiah. Okay? Being the church means believing that he came. Remember I told you the Israelites, they believe in the prophecies concerning the Messiah. But when he came, they didn't believe it was him. Okay? So you could believe what the Bible says, but that doesn't mean you believe in what the Bible says. There's a difference. You could believe in the history, but you may not receive it as the truth. Okay? Being the church means believing that he came and did what he said he did. That's being the church. And that because of it, you can have everlasting life and have it more abundantly, which reflects in everything you do and say, making the necessary adjustments to re ensure 
you remain in alignment with Him. Okay? That means, be then, that salvation requires a response. You can't say that you are saved and be the same as you were before you were saved. Salvation requires a response. If you say you believe in Jesus, then there should be a difference in you. You do things differently. You act differently. You speak differently. You think differently. You act differently. If you don't have no response to getting saved, you ain't safe. I'm sorry, but you're not. Salvation requires a response. And it's automatic. You want to want to do it. You don't have to be pushed to do it. When you are truly saved, you want to do things, the things that Jesus said that you're supposed to do. Okay? If all you do is go to church but not go to the world with the message he gave, he says, you are not a part of him and do not share in his life. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. My commandments that you go. Okay? As a matter of fact, the only reason he asked that we even go to church is to fellowship with each other and to strategize ministry toward the world. That's the only reason we're supposed to be meeting, to encourage each other to go. That's the only reason we're supposed to meet in that building. Not to worship, not to hear from God. Excuse me, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to be hearing from God 24-7. Not from the man on that pulpit. That man on the pulpit only supposed to be confirming to you what you've already been told. Okay? And that's fellowship. And you, you, you standing in agreement with each other through the word that's being taught. You know, if he's saying one thing and God is telling you something different, then that's a problem. Okay? As stated before, and in conclusion, we must not just go to church, but we must be the church. Okay? The world and God is depending on us. Okay? I hope I've given you enough about the difference between church and religion today. There's a big difference. Okay? Religion is scary. Okay? Be careful. Religion usually is a, 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 a system of tradition. Just doing the same things over and over and over and over and over. You never see no different results. You never get no response from God. You never see no difference in the, what you what's happening to your life or to you because of what you're doing. No, no. God said there's supposed to be things that's supposed to be different for you. You're supposed to experience certain success, healing. You're supposed to experience uh, 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 wisdom, knowledge, understanding. You're supposed to go deeper in me, he says. You're supposed to, as the more time you spend with me, you learn and understand more. So, And I need you to understand more because I need you to go and teach this. You see? Like I said, salvation requires a response. Okay? You've got to respond to it. If you're not responding to it, if it doesn't change you, then you are no different. You are no different. You're the same person that you always were. You cannot be the same once you receive salvation. It's impossible. If you're still the same way, you, you trust me, what you, what you received was maybe some, an emotional feeling, but you did not receive Jesus Christ as Lord. Okay, you did not receive the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry. But you can, if you have this real desire for him. God will give himself to any man who wants him. I don't care what that man has done. God forgives. And he needs people to take his message. Okay? You are his hands, his eyes, and his ears on earth. And that's why he gave himself to you, to us. Okay? So I hope you got something from this teaching today. It was my pleasure to bring it to you, and I, I'm looking forward to being with you again every week. And by the way, our, our teaching next week will be about sin, okay? 
sin, the most frequent and negative occurrence on earth. Okay, sin, the most frequent and negative occurrence on earth. I want to thank you for this broadcast, for being here with me today. I love you all, man. And I'm going to keep doing this as long as God keeps giving it to me. You know, every week I have to pray to God. I say, God, what's what's next? What's next? You know, and he, he, he keeps giving it to me. I Listen, I don't plan this stuff, you know. I have to ask God every week. And God ke keeps me two to three teachings ahead. I keep asking him so I can tell. I said, God, I got to tell him what's going to be next week. And he gives it to me. You know, this isn't planned. This is just God. I'm just, remember the Bible says, when you go before kings, don't worry about what you will say. He said, I will give you what to say. My Holy Spirit will speak through you. And I'm confirming with God that that's what he's doing in me. I'm not planning, just waiting for God to give it to me. And that's what he's been doing. God is awesome, man. He's awesome. And he's blessed my life tremendously. And I won't stop. I won't stop. Oh, sneeze is trying to come. But I won't stop. <coughs> Excuse me, y'all. Excuse me. But I won't stop. I'm going to keep doing this until the day I die. As long as he gave it to me, I'll keep doing it. So I thank you all again. It's great being here. I'm looking forward to you next week. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all. So take care. And church of your choice tomorrow. If not, watch your church. Go. You can watch any church online you want to, but just make sure they're giving you the right message. Okay? Or you can watch one of my teachings again. Go back and uh, you, there are many there in, on my page, Facebook page. Make sure you get the spelling right. And support me. Please share. Share, share, share my teachings, please. Please share, man. Y'all got to help me. Share, okay? Share with the world. Share with your groups. Share in your WhatsApp. Send it to your WhatsApp so you can share with your groups, okay? And then they will share, hopefully. But this is my CD. You can purchase it online, any of the social media sites. And I will see you all next week, okay? God bless and keep you until then. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.